Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Trey Grayson. I serve as the director of the Institute of Politics right here. And I'm glad to see all of you here. This is a tough time of year for us. It's the last full week of classes. So I appreciate the students who are here who probably, yeah, who probably should be studying or doing something. So I appreciate your priorities that you're here uh, to talk, to listen to, and hopefully engage in the question and answer session, one of a really important topic, uh, frankly, the biggest story in politics over the last year, and that's the Tea Party. We're, pl we're pleased to have four uh, great guests with us here today. I want to briefly introduce them, but I want to point out in your program, there's more uh, detailed bios. But to my immediate left is Andrew Hemingway. Andrew is the chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus in New Hampshire. He might have something to do with the presidential race next year in his state, or I guess it actually starts sort of this year, but the actual election will be next year. It's already started. Uh, Jenny Beth Martin, who's the national coordinator and co-founder of Tea Party Patriots, is to his left. Uh, Jenny Beth's from Atlanta, Georgia. Shannon Travis, uh, I guess you're probably also from, technically from Atlanta then, right? Because uh, CNN, Washington. you're based in Washington. Uh, as a political producer and reporter for CNN uh, for many years. And to his left is Kate Zernike. Kate's a political uh, correspondent with the New York Times, uh, has covered campaigns, politics, and actually we spent a day together in Eastern Kentucky last year uh, during my Senate run. So we're really pleased to have all of you uh, in the back room, we were talking about how to begin this conversation. You know, we pitched this as a, a discussion of the Tea Party and its impact on sort of forward-looking on the budget battle and, and also on the presidential race. But I think in order to have that discussion, we all agree we needed to start back at the beginning. And one question we, want, we all agree would be a good one to have each of their perspectives is what exactly is the Tea Party? And what does it mean when you hear that term to each one of you? So I want to ask all of them to begin, uh, starting with Andrew. Sure. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, the Tea Party is, I guess in my estimation, um, basically uh, average citizens who have seen the incredible rapid growth of government intruding on uh, literally every aspect of their lives, who have basically come together and said, you know, enough's enough. It's time for the people to take back uh, government. It's time for um, the uh, our republic, basically, to return into the, the people's hands, the people's uh, will. And so after you saw a number of different things occur um, in Washington and across the country, uh, not, not only just at the state and local levels, but at the federal level, I think there was this enormous uh, pent-up tension that, that basically the org you know, people started saying, no, look, we've got to do something. We have to start organizing. Mm -hmm. And then um, you know, there was the election, and then especially there was the um, the passing of, um, you know, Obamacare, that really, that was kind of the explosion of the whole thing. So the, the Tea Party, to me, is um, the average American citizens who have a um, very clear set of priorities and, and principles who've said these are being violated and we're not going to stand for it. Yeah. Jenny Beth, what do you think about it? Um, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and we have three core values. They are fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. And that's what unites us all around the country and around the world are those three core values. Shan. First, I want to thank the Kennedy School uh, for inviting me and us here. Yes, thank this you. is obviously something that Kate and I live and breathe reporting wise, <laughs> and you all live and breathe in terms of activism. I also want to just take a shameless plug to thank my mother and my good friend who are in the audience. In the front <laughs> um, there's not much more that I could add to that. I mean, they're both absolutely correct in terms of what the, what the Tea Party is. But I would just say it's a movement. I mean, it's, it's a movement that is very similar to other political movements that we've seen in US history. I mean, you've seen way back to colonial days. Uh, different movements, the Federalists or what have you. In more recent times, you saw the Perot crowd, you know, advocating a lot of the same things that the Tea Party movement advocates, smaller government, limited taxes or what have you. So the Tea Party movement is a movement where people are taking their issues, their ideas, their aggression to the streets and saying, hey, enough is enough. And they're mobilizing. It's very grassroots. Uh, I, uh, Jenny Beth and I were talking a moment ago about how their website for the Patriots is very easy for anyone mm -hmm. to go on there and say, hey, I live in Akron, Ohio. How can I get involved with my local Tea Party? Boom, you pop in your zip code and you know someone who's maybe in your neighborhood who's, who's, uh, who's involved and how you can get involved. So it's a movement 
where people are going to the streets and saying, hey, these are our issues. This is what we want from our elected leaders. So. What I would say is, you know, people are, some people, when I would talk about, they would say, well, is it actually a party? And there's sort of sense that there was a headquarters somewhere in Washington, and it was an actual political party or wanted to be a third party. And so what I would always say is it's not a party. It's a movement. But really, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is, I was saying this backstage, it's really a state of mind. And so when people sort of try to look and count up the number of Tea Party groups or um, count up the number of people who, who have been at a Tea Party rally, in many ways, particularly going into the election cycle, that was the wrong metric to look at. What you needed to look at was the number of people who were identifying themselves as Tea Party supporters and who went to the polls inclined to vote for the Tea Party. In terms of sort of people who I met, you know, over the course of, of reporting, I would say they, they sort of fell into two different camps. One were the people who came to the Tea Party with a very ideological perspective. And maybe they were, you know, oftentimes they were younger Ron Paul supporters and they tended to be sort of the organizers. And then there were people who came to the Tea Party um, much more sort of out of frustration. And it wasn't even, it, it was sort of this, uh, you know, ambient frustration. You know, it wasn't even one particular issue, but it was, it was that the economy was in the tank and people didn't know what to do and they were, for lack of a better phrase, freaked out about it. Uh, and so they were looking for some way to get their frustration out, and I think they found that in the Tea Party. Um, I know it's unfair you just gave an answer, but I'm going to pick on you again. How did you decide to start covering it, the, the movement? You ended up, Kate ended up writing a book. Well, what, what's the title of your book? Let's have a plug. Bo Boiling Mad Inside Tea Party America. And you can buy it on Amazon.com or any of the countless bookstores here at Harvard Square. Yeah. And Shannon has a documentary. I'll even sign it for you. He did as well. <laughs> She'll sign it for you. But, but how did you, I mean, maybe, maybe your editor said, go cover this, but, but what, how? How did you get started? How did you get, and obviously you got interested enough to write a book. Yeah. So how did. Well, so I, um, we've, the Times has had a beat since about 2003 covering conservatives. And so it had kind of, it had gone a little bit dormant for various personnel reasons. But so I was coming back from leave in, in late 2009 and someone said, you know, my boss said, we, we don't have someone covering conservatives. Would you do that? And I covered Sarah Palin in the, in the 08 campaign. So it was kind of a natural for me. Um, and it was just pretty clear that if you were going to cover conservatives, you were going to cover the Tea Party. And one of the first stories I did was I went to Florida just after Election Day uh, 2009 to do a piece about the Rubio Christ mm -hmm. race, which by then, you know, at that point was like, oh yeah, Marco Rubio is this long shot. Sure. Um, but to me, it was just, you know, it was obviously, it was very clear the energy was around the Tea Party. And it, it was interesting to me, just all these people, a lot of them who had not been politically active, but I'm just always interested as a reporter in what motivates people and what makes people do these things. And so to me, it was just sort of, you know, you know, who are these people? You know, <laughs> sort of, and, and some of the Tea Partiers would say to me, oh, I know you New York Times reporters come out here and say, who are these people? And it's like, well, you're right. You know, I want to know what's, what, what brings you to the streets. Um, and I guess I just found that really interesting because there were so many different stories. Shannon, about you, and then we'll get to a couple of folks who would be the kind of people you'd ask that question of. I wish I had as substantive of a reason for <laughs> covering the Tea Party movement as, as Kate, but I don't. Uh, it was really by accident that I kind of fell into it. Um, when I first started, when I first started with my, my current unit, I'm over at the political unit now, I used to be more show-based before this, um, and I was new and green, and they needed someone to do some pre-producing, just pure logistics for, I think, the third Tea Party Express bus tour. You know, the roving bus tour mm -hmm. where the buses go out across the country and they have the rallies or whatever. And they just needed a producer to go to these stops before the bus got there, like the night before, make contacts with people, and just set everything up, make sure our live shot position was fine or whatever, and then leave. So I wasn't even editorially really involved with reporting on the movement at that time. Well, what happened was, as I was doing a lot of these pre-planning, and I inevitably stayed for some of the rallies, I saw that, and about that time, I think the movement had been around for maybe a few months, maybe about a year. I saw that what I was seeing at the rallies, to me, felt like there was a huge disconnect from what we were actually showing. So what I mean is that, the dominant storyline in the media was that this was a bunch of just all white people who had you know, signs of Obama as a monkey or were racist or what have you. That was the dominant storyline in a lot of media outlets, but I didn't see that when I was actually out there. Now, you might have guessed that I'm an African-American reporter, so <laughs> I was especially sensitive to this. I mean, obviously I'm a professional reporter, so that doesn't enter my, my reporting, but I was sensitive to seeing some of those things that I thought I might see because again, this was the, stom the dominant line out there in the media. So uh, long story short, I penned a 
piece, first person, uh, a reporter's notebook where I inserted myself into the story and said, hey, I think there's a disconnect between what's out here and what we're reporting on. That caught fire. I was interested from that moment, and from there, I just kind of continued covering, uh, covering it. Tell me about now. You're, you're now a national leader in this yeah. big national movement. Um, what's, how did you get involved? Did you wake up one day? Was it a culmination of, you know, a lot of things? And, <laughs> and how and how did you, you know, how did you get started? Okay, I. I have been involved in Republican mm -hmm. politics at the local and at the state level in Georgia for many years, and I was a Republican activist. And we sat around complaining about George Bush and the Republican Congress when both chambers were controlled by Republicans, but we weren't really doing anything. And we we're frustrated, but we weren't doing anything. And then um, the TARP bill happened in October, it passed in October of 08. And McCain put his whole campaign on hold for this bill. And then he and, and then Senator Obama voted exactly the same. There was nothing that distinguished the two of them. And people were really upset at all of that spending. In my area where I lived, I was the county campaign chair for my senator, Saxby Chambliss. And in Georgia, you have, to, you have to win by 50% plus one vote to win an election. So people were cutting off the McCain on the McCain-Palin bumper stickers because they were angry at McCain for that vote. And then I, I literally couldn't pay people $5 if I had wanted to, to take a Saxby Shambliss sign or bumper sticker. They had nothing to do with it. And he wound up going to a runoff. He won the runoff. Had he not been the filibuster-proof vote, which is where he was at the time, I don't even know. He probably still would have won the runoff, but I don't know that it would have been with the same margin. So people were angry in red state Georgia and in my county, which is very red. Um, which county? Which is Cherokee County. Cher Cherokee, OK. Um, so, so that was going on. And then, and then Rick Santelli, who is a reporter on the floor of the Chicago Stock Exchange for CNBC, he had this rant right at the time that the stimulus bill was passing in, in February of 09, and he said, I, this is wrong, our founding fathers would be upset, this is just, we cannot continue this. I'm gonna start a tea party right here in Chicago. Anyone who wants to join me can come out on the 4th of July and join me. And it was just this ad hoc rant. I don't think, I, he had no clue what he was doing. But he did that and it was like lighting a match. And it just spread like wildfire. I was involved, at that point I was involved online with a few groups smart girl politics, top mm -hmm. conservatives on Twitter, and the don't go movement. And we started- What's the don't go movement? That's of the three, that's the one maybe less familiar to people. Yeah, know. and it went, so. Oh, so it went, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> so, um, but smart girl politics and TCOT, pound yeah. SGP and pound TCOT on Twitter. We were tweeting about it and someone said, hey, let's do a conference call and get it and speak with bigger than 140 characters about what we're talking about. So the very next day after his rant, we had a conference call, it's a Friday night at like 7 or 8 p.m. Eastern time. There were roughly 22 of us on that conference call from around the country, and we decided we're gonna have a tea party. We weren't sure what they were. Um, we knew there'd be some sort of protest, and my vision of what a protest would be was what I imagined from the 60s, you know, from the anti-war protests. And so um, we hung up the phone that night thinking we'd have five to 10 tea parties around the country. The following Friday, we had 48 tea parties with 35,000 people in attendance. And it's just grown from there. And, and it was, the whole reason we did this was the, phys, the fiscal issues that Rick Santelli was talking about in his rant. And because of Facebook and Twitter, we were able to grow mm -hmm. One of my favorite details about the Rick Santelli rant was apparently he said later that the only reason he mentioned the Boston Tea Party was that his daughter, who I believe is in either second or seventh grade, I don't know, I don't know when you study the Tea Party, but that she, had, she was doing a book report on the Tea Party and he was helping her with it and so he just sort of was on his mind. off yeah. of his head said like, <laughs> we ought to have a Tea Party and so suddenly it became the Tea Party. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, so I, I got started, um, I guess basically because, you know, things were happening in, in uh, my area of New Hampshire. So 
my political uh, background or training, right, comes from my dad, who's in the audience, who uh, in, our, in our part of New Hampshire, you basically run your own business because uh, there isn't a lot of industry. So we have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of small business owners. It lends to New Hampshire's kind of conservative heritage. And so obviously people were upset about things that were happening. People were upset at Republicans. People were upset at Democrats. And I think there's this overall uh, sense of you know, disgust with the political process in our country today. I think it still exists. I mean, I think people from all spectrums of, of the ideology would say, we're disgusted with the way politics is done in the United States right now today. And so as things started to really ramp up with the Tea Party, you know, I got an email from somebody who said, oh, we're doing a Tea Party here, we're doing a Tea Party there. All of a sudden you go like, wow, I mean, I saw it on, you know, CNN and I read it in the Times, but I mean, in New Hampshire, really? Mm -hmm. You know, like, we're Yankees. I mean, we're real Yankees, right? I mean, we're not going to come out of our... You've got to watch the use of that word in Boston, though, but I, I know what you mean. <laughs> right. <laughs> I should have known better. <laughs> but we, you know, I was going, you know, are people really going to come out for these, for these, you know, things? And, and then, uh, you know, in Concord, on the, on the steps of the Capitol, you have a thousand people turn out. Mm -hmm. uh, th that is enormous. I mean, y you don't have that happening. And today, still, you know, across the, the state, I was at a meeting just the other night, and the guy stands up and says, hey, look, the Republican group in our, in our county has about five people who show up every week. We're now running 200. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really the story of what's happening in New Hampshire. And so, you know, just seeing kind of what, what was going on. Uh, normally, when I get involved in stuff, I end up, like, taking over, <laughs> I guess. That's okay. So, so okay. I ended up, uh, I was asked to be the, the chairman of this uh, large liberty organization, Republican Liberty Caucus and uh, started working within kind of uh, the, the Tea Party at that point as a, as a leader, um, and really focusing primarily on New Hampshire and then now on the presidential races. So. Let me ask this question. I, mean, I don't want to skip over the, I mean, part of me wants to skip over the last election because I didn't do so well. <laughs> but but I, you know, we're, we're somewhat pressed for time and I think I want to get onto the budget and the presidential race. But so the, this, this clearly, this, this, the motivated voters, the, the activists, the energy, the passion, all that, swept through the country in 2010, and we saw a lot of mm -hmm. uh, Tea Party candidates, either folks who were legitimately Tea Party candidates or folks who were able to grab on and market themselves or position themselves as these Tea Party candidates. So they get into Congress, and the, the House changes over to be Republican-dominated. The Senate's now close to 50-50, and uh, we've just gone through the, the budget fight, the first, I guess, the, the second round of the budget fight on the continuing resolution for this current fiscal year, and now we're getting ready to have the bigger one on the going forward. Mm -hmm. um, maybe from, I'll just kind of throw this up and whoever wants to start can chime in. Um, this energy, this enthusiasm, how, how is it going? Is it, it's, in, it's clearly impacting policy. You know, we have a different Congress than we would have. Um, but now that we have those members, are you, you know, what is maybe the attitude inside the Tea Party among the activists you deal with in New Hampshire and Jenny Beth, you maybe have more of a national perspective of how it's going so far. Is there, um, are you seeing the same level of attendance? Or is there satisfaction with the, how these votes have been taking place? And then maybe I'll ask Shannon and, and Kate the same. Uh, so in, in the, this last election, right? Yeah. The New Hampshire House, uh, we have 400 members uh, of our New Hampshire House. We have 24 uh, state senators. So we, um, we that, that's New Hampshire style. If, uh, we're going to do it different than anybody else. 400 state yeah. house members? We, we have the largest house and the smallest Senate. So we're going to be different than anybody else, no matter what happens. <laughs> Um, but in, in the New Hampshire House, so the Republican Liberty Caucus and the Tea Party, was, we were successful in getting through uh, close to 100 state reps. So that's a quarter of the, mm -hmm. of the House. We have about eight state senators. Um, the chairman of the New Hampshire GOP, we were able to elect, yeah. um, and also the Speaker of the House. Um, we were the only organization to go out and to endorse him who now won. So we are having a very real effect on policy at the, at the state level, a very, very real effect. We have many bills that that we have, as an organization and as you know, Tea Party members have put forward and have passed. Um, and you know, that really is the way that, that we're seeing an, an effect. Federally, you know, people weren't, weren't so motivated, I would say, in New Hampshire to be involved in, the, in a lot of the, I mean, there was a lot of activity, mm -hmm. but there was definitely a disconnect between the, the federal level races and the state level races. And I think the reason for that is because um, the, the state level races are so grassroots. Um, you have one representative for every 3,000 people. Yeah. So, you know, it's your mechanic, it's your barber, yeah. it's your, you know. You dentist. make your barber mad, then you're done. <laughs> it's yeah. all over. Yeah. So, so, so there was a very real sense of this is a, this is a grassroots movement that's, that's yeah. happening in New Hampshire. 
and there was definitely a disconnect between what's hap what was happening kind of federally. Yeah, Jenny Beth from the, maybe the National Center. Kate, just to prepare you, since I know you've been spending a lot of time in Wisconsin, I want you to think yeah. about that. Okay, so are we talking about budget or yeah, elections well, how about the, or both? How about budget right now? Okay. Sort of like budget or, or more broadly policy making in All Congress. Right. And by the way, I had no clue that New Hampshire had 400. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> um, the, the budget, the continuing resolutions mm -hmm. that were passed, people are, are so angry still. And right now, they're really angry at the Republicans. Mm. So the, there's, there's this learning curve when we started, we had to learn how to do a protest. And my, the first protest I went to, there were businessmen in their suits and ties. It was pouring down rain. They're holding signs with an umbrella. That, that was how <laughs> we, we protested. That's a good image. would have been good TV, Shannon, right? <laughs> well, CNN was there, so. We're always there. But we were in downtown Atlanta, so. Um, but, so then we had to learn how to make our voices heard and turn this into action and deal with the Democrat majority. Mm -hmm. Now we're learning how to do this with the Republican majority in the House and the Democrat in the Senate and the White House. And people are really frustrated because the Republicans are still playing politics as usual. They are not paying attention to the fact that this movement is what got them where they are. Mm -hmm. And it's the core values that the people in this movement articulated that they ran on and pledged certain things to that got them to the point where they're in a majority. And the, the games are still going. And so the frustration is, is not so much, it is with the policy and it's also with the fact that the games are still going. I think part of the reason President Obama won is because people are sick of the games in Washington. I think that that has a lot to do with it. I think that's why, why the, I think it's gonna affect the next elections as well. It, People are tired of the way things are going. Can I piggyback on that just real quick? Yeah, sure. The, and then I, I believe that the, the, the Tea Party's core values, what, what, what every single member of the Tea Party would say, this is you know, the, the, the common denominator, this is where we all agree mm -hmm. right here, are, are things that, that made our country the greatest nation on earth. It is, it, it is those values, those principles that, that formed this country, that made this country. And I think what the Tea Party is at, at its at its root is a revival of those principles. It's a revival of those, those values. And we are seeing those, those things, regardless of party, and I, and I think that's, that's what people have to recognize, is that we are seeing those things violated on, on every level across every you know, political party, and that's what people are upset about. So when they see something happen with you know, John Boehner and you know, some ridiculous deal made that you know, is trumpeted as you know, a great deal, that, you know, People are going, like, this, this isn't what... you're what, talking about the continuing resolution. Yeah, continuing yeah. resolution, right. Yeah. And, and probably going forward. I mean, <laughs> there's not a lot of hope there. Um, I think that people are saying, you know, this is a violation of, of those values, those principles. We know this is the wrong direction. And, and, and we're going to do something about it. Shannon. From a reporter standpoint, I, I would say that, that the knife cuts both ways. The Tea Party has been wildly successful in, in the last election. They elected, uh, I mean, they flipped the House, obviously. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of their, you got a lot of your candidates in. Uh, some Senate seats, some key Senate seats you won. Um, you you're, didn't get the kind of numbers that you wanted in the last budget agreement. The, you, you know, the Repo House Republicans promised $100 billion cut. They passed a bill that was like $61 billion. No, it was $352 million. Right. Million. Right. 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 That's a technical, <laughs> yeah, we can go into that. But, but I think we can agree that the cut's bigger, the bigger than it would have been if it right. weren't for the Tea Party. Well, Much. if they quit the out of control hundreds of billions of right. spending overnight. It, was, it, was, it really wasn't even the numbers. It's the leadership. Right. But I think what Shannon's saying, though, is politically it's clearly had an impact. Right. You can the, disagree with her. The point that I'm trying to make, though, is that for all of the successes, it's also like success breeds controversy a lot right. of times and the Tea Party movement's successes and their tactics have also given fodder to their critics who say, you, you've heard this before, that you all are inflexible, that it's unrealistic some of these cuts that you want, that it will affect, disproportionately affect poor people, older people, the Ryan, the Ryan budget uh, plan that's going to basically reform Medicare, drastically change uh, how Medicaid is, is funded. 
Um, so it gives political fodder to your critics to say, look at these extremists. Uh, and so when I report, when Kate and I report, we have to report from both sides, right. not just all of the good things that the Tea Party movement has done, but also look at how the criticism is boiling up. Uh, and, and you hear those words all the time, that they're extremists, that they're inflexible, that they're going to bring down the Republican Party, that there's infighting. I mean, not you all, but uh, Tea Party Nation, Judson Phillips, actually called for a primary challenge to Speaker Boehner because he felt like he was weak. I think he compared him to Charlie Sheen, I, which when sure. I saw that, I was like, Charlie Sheen's angels and John Boehner, I don't quite get it. <laughs> but yeah, so, so for all of the success, it's also created a fair amount of controversy. I think what's happening is, you know, all along, it's been kind of unclear. As I said, the Tea Party was, was sort of a state of mind. And, but it was also sort of this division within the Tea Party between the people who came with sheer frustration and, and not necessarily any defined ideology and people who were sort of activists who had a real firm sort of polit a sense politically and ideologically what they wanted and, and economically what they thought should happen. And so what the Republican Party is struggling with is this notion that, okay, these people put us in power, but we're not quite sure what they wanted. Um, we look at polls, and polls say that a lot of people don't want us to change Medicare. Um, but the Tea Party is telling us that we need to be more fiscally responsible, and to do that, we need to do something about Medicare. So I think it's, it's, it's the result of sort of this unresolved question of, we know what the Tea Party is, but what do they really want? What does the Tea Party want, and is that what most Americans want? And so I think that's the question that we're seeing. That's sort of the, the larger question. And, and just to really quickly add to that, because that's a great question, I often say to a lot of Tea Party activists, okay, you want reduced spending, but what specifically would you cut? And I think when you get to that level of specificity, a lot of people realize, hey, if we really want to affect the budget, like we all here know, but maybe not everyone knows, that you have to go into entitlement programs. Medicare, military Medicaid, spending. military spending, exactly, Social Security. There can't be any sacred cow. There can't be any sacred None. cow, but if you're going to really, really affect change, the kind of change that you all want, it has to be primarily in defense spending and entitlement. Yeah, you can cut all yeah. discretionary domestic spending, which and you still defense, won't even and you still don't balance the budget. You won't right. you won't balance the budget. You won't even touch the surface. Right. And so when you start to say to people real questions, okay, you're a Tea Party activist, you want to cut, you know, dramatically cut spending. Are you willing to give up your Medicare? Right. Are you willing to dramatically scale back or privatize your Social Security? Then people start to say, well, wait a minute, I didn't know. At least some people I've spoken with, I didn't know that it was that stuff. So. Andrew, you wanted to add something. Oh, well, I was going to say. You, I, mean, I think you had some ideas on what to cut. So. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, that's, but, but, but to be fair, I mean, you are an activist. You are someone who does come at this. You have, a, you have sort of a, a political ideology that's, that's driving you in this. And I do think that, you know, to, so to sort of to ask you guys, of course you're going to have a clear answer and you're going to have a laundry list of things to cut or, or maybe even just an overarching, you know, approach to the budget. But I think most Tea Party supporters, people who don't go to meetings, people who don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, who just went to the ballot box thinking like, I want those And more guys importantly, out. might enjoy those benefits. I'd enjoy Social right. Security, Medicaid, Medicare. And nobody's calling for the elimination of Medicare. I mean, I think it's kind of, I mean, n n n nobody's saying like, oh, you know, you're going to lose all of your Medicare. No, I think I, I what think everybody's talking about is entitlement reform. And the, re the reality is this, folks, is that you know, we're, we're, we're on, on a speeding bus going over a cliff as a country. I mean, we are. I mean, we're spending uh, out of control, and it's non-sustainable. You look at any economic, uh, you know, forecast from anybody, and this type of spending that, we're, that currently is, is happening at the federal level is unsustainable. So I think what the Tea Party is saying is, one, we're holding up a big red flag saying, look, these issues have to be addressed. So let's, let's you know, these things ha have to happen. Something has to happen here with these things. And there are folks on, on, the, on the left, I guess, or on the other side of the extreme who are going, hey, you know, you know stuff has to happen. Something has to happen. Everybody agrees something has to happen. Right, what but I don't and think how is, is obviously right. the, the battle that we're seeing in Washington. And, and we're standing up saying, look, this is what we want. This is what we think our representatives should be doing. And, and what we are based on is the Constitution. We're based on values and principles that, that are found in the Constitution that made this country what it is today. And I think. Those are the things that, that we're trying to bring forward. I, if I could add, um, Kate, I knew we were, I mentioned, the, I alluded to Wisconsin, you've been covering Wisconsin a lot. Are there any lessons to be learned, and then, and then we'll come back and we'll do the presidential and then we'll open it up. Um, this almost seems like, especially because we did have an election in Wisconsin, albeit they're sort of proxies. Yeah. 
you know, you had the, 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 the race for the Supreme Court We're going to have there. elections in Wisconsin all the way till yeah. November yeah. of next year. Yeah, I mean, it'll be an interesting. Right. I think we'll be watching. In Kentucky, we like to think that we are very special because we have our governor's right. race here before. Races. I think we're going to be boring compared to Wisconsin. <laughs> but, but you've been up there. Are, you know, obviously, there was a strong Tea Party movement in Wisconsin that helped yeah. the Republicans pick up a lot of seats, change the dynamic, and st uh, Scott Walker was elected as part of this. Then he actually had to go govern and tried to, to get right. some legislation passed. Um, how's the Tea Party movement up there faring? What kind of impact did it have? And then with this reaction with, with labor and, and right. others reacting, and some of the polling shows that it's not entirely clear that what right. the governor tried to do or has been able to do is that popular. And that's, what's, that, that's what I mean. Sort of, I think there was, there was a lot of emotion out there, and people reacted on a very emotional level and, and voted for people like Scott Walker and for, for Ron Johnson. Ron Johnson, yes, it's his first yep. name. Sorry, I'm sure. it's his first name. Sorry, anyway, <laughs> against against Russ Feingold. Um, so I think what happened was what we saw with collective bargaining was the result of all this. And anybody who was watching the Tea Party closely, anybody who sort of knew what the ideology behind this was, could have predicted Scott Walker. But when you went to voters and talked to them in Wisconsin and said, you know, there were people on the lines who, who had not or who had voted for Scott Walker. And what was so interesting to me was one woman said, you know, a lot of my neighbors voted for Scott Walker because um, he didn't want to spend all this money on a high-speed train. And we thought the high-speed train was a waste of money. And so we voted for Scott Walker because he was saying, I'm not going to spend all your money on a high-speed train. And, and not necessarily because of the collective body. They didn't think that. that he was, yeah. you know, he said he was going to balance the budget. And they sort of look now and say, well, what does getting rid of collective bargaining have to do with balancing the budget? And I know there's an answer that people can offer an answer for that. Others can disagree with that answer. But my point is that, again, people sort of came in maybe voting on the train or voting out of anger, but it yeah. wasn't necessarily, they didn't know that they were voting. And he kept the promise back. on the train. He, he rejected right, the right. funding and, and, um, and all that. But as you say, the polls have shown that, in fact, you know, I think it's the majority of Americans don't necessarily think that we should get rid of collective bargaining for public employees. I, I've been in Wisconsin twice in the past few weeks. Um, the first time I went, I, I, the unions are so well organized. And, and I, I went back and I, I was waiting at an airport to get back home and I, I was talking to my husband and just saying, they are so well organized. It's, I, I know what AstroTurf looks like because I saw it, and I, I was a little bit envious of it. You know, I mean, they were organized. They had printed signs. They, there, there were things that maybe they weren't doing well, but for the most part, they were very well organized. And it, it was very interesting to me to watch, having been to so many protests that were were really and truly grassroots and were not that well organized, including the one that I went to in Wisconsin, and. Um, and then when that election came, I was there the weekend before the election with Prosser. And I could tell just from the people I was talking to at the hotel, just employees, cab drivers, that it was going to be a really close election. And I, based on the organization and the money that was going in, especially from the union side, and I thought that they were doing a better job getting their message out. Had the election even been just, and it was, it was close, had the election been close and Prosser lost, I still think it would have shown that Walker, that people support what Walker's doing. The fact that he won shows that people support it. If he'd lost by a huge margin, I, I think that that would say something different. I think the polling on the collective bargaining issue versus what they were actually doing with the public employee, government worker unions, it, it, it's, it, they're not asking the right questions. I don't right. think they're asking the right questions with Medicare either. Do you, do you support Medicare reform? Well, if you're 65, 60 years old, or 55, and you've been planning on this for retirement, yeah, you support it, but not if, it's, not if that's what you're I'll, planning on. Just, and the Ryan plan, you know, I think that getting into those intricacies would be an interesting poll. See. I'll just say one really quick point about Wisconsin, and, and full disclosure, I, I haven't been to Wisconsin to cover it. I've yeah. just kind of been following it from afar. But it seems to me that we should watch Wisconsin, mm -hmm. because it seems to me that Wisconsin is the first reality of the Tea Party movement and their sympathizers actually getting what they wanted passed. We haven't seen it on a federal mm -hmm. level yet, and really no place else that, I've, that, that I can think yeah. of right now. The reason why we should watch Wisconsin is to see if what they actually have passed, what they actually achieved, 
will be popular with people? Will people like it? So beforehand, people said cut spending, cut spending. Well, now this is the reality of cutting, cutting spending. spending. How will that play? Right. I don't know, but I think, I think we should watch it. Wisconsin's about to run the presidential election. So I, I think absolutely. Wisconsin yeah. is where it's at. If I were a reporter, that's what I'd be covering. Well, why don't we, I'm going to be John McLaughlin here. We'll do an exit question, and then we'll kick it to the audience. And I'll start with Mr. New Hampshire here. Yes. Um, how do you think this is going to play out in the presidential race? How's it playing out in New Hampshire? Because the reality is, is how it plays out in New Hampshire may matter more, at least from the primary, than how it plays out. I don't know when Wisconsin's primary is, but I suspect it won't have much of an influence, certainly not as much of an influence as, as New Hampshire. How do you think this is going to play out over the next um, eight months or so until the New Hampshire primary? Well, uh, I mean, the, the, the primary is alive and, and well in New Hampshire, and it is uh, you know, in full force. So um, I, I, didn't, I didn't really know, honestly, going into it. So like January, I was going like, I wonder how you know, how big this is going to be. We had just had a really great, successful November. Mm -hmm. Republicans had taken back a lot, and a lot of them were, you know, liberty-minded Republicans. It wasn't, you know, your kind of mainstream Republicans. And for the New Hampshire GOP chairman's race, we had, um, uh, you know, John H. Sununu, who was a former chief of staff. Mm -hmm. He is, you know, in New Hampshire, he represents kind of that establishment yeah. Republican. I mean, he is a, the classic Republican insider, right? And we, uh, he had kind of uh, handpicked his successor. Uh, and then the Tea Party came along and the Republican Liberty Caucus endorsed um, a guy who was, who was a kind of a Tea Party leader. Yeah, Jack Kimball. Jack Kimball, who ended up, uh, we ended up winning. So, so Jack ended up winning. And that, for me, was the first time that I went, okay, that, that's kind of a, a sign right there because we've got 400 delegates who are, who are voting on this. Those are the insiders. And we're starting to see a, a real shift here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we started seeing legislation in the House and things like that. When I started getting calls from, from you know, and I don't, from presidential candidates, I started going like, wow, like, I think we're actually, like, doing something. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about me. It's not about, they're not calling me because I'm important. They're calling me because they recognize that, that the Tea Party in New Hampshire is important. Is important. Right. And that's really where the activity is. That's where the energy mm -hmm. is. And... Like I gave you the story before, I mean, some guy goes, hey, there's four people at a Republican meeting. It's the four people every single month we go. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're drawing 200. I mean, you're, you're a candidate. Who are you going to go talk to, right? Mm -hmm. So w once, once, once that started happening, I started going, wow, you know, we, we really have a chance at this. And then what, ha what started happening was um, I started meeting with other Tea Party leaders saying, look, you know, guys, we're going to have 10 candidates. We're going to have 250,000 voters. I mean, that's... I, I, I mean, for the first in the nation primary state, we have 250,000 voters. You have 10 candidates. Mm -hmm. That means you're, you're looking at you know, 25,000 votes. So you go, OK, 50,000 votes wins the New Hampshire primary right now. I know we have that many members in the state. So what we've started to do is start to say, OK, let's be smart about this, and let's start coming around. And it matches what the, you know, the flag and what Benjamin Franklin did when he cut up the snake when he's trying to rally the colonies, right? His, his, his theme was unite or die. And, and that right now in New Hampshire represents the, the New Hampshire Tea Party. We're saying unite or die, and we are, we are gathering, we are coalescing, and we will be getting behind one presidential candidate, and we will be pushing them through the, the Republican primary. Jenny, about maybe from more of a national perspective, although you're a neighbor of South Carolina, and that obviously is another early primary mm -hmm. state that will have a, play a major role. Uh, that will be the third state, and maybe the one that uh, uh, decide, you know, if Iowa and New Hampshire split. Uh, the, the, the tiebreaker may be South Carolina, but what, what's your take on all this for the presidential um, race? I, I think what you're doing is very interesting. I, we at Tea Party Patriots, we don't endorse candidates at a national level, so we won't be endorsing mm -hmm. anyone because you don't want me coming into New Hampshire from Georgia telling you who you should be voting for. We trust the local people to make the decision for who they should be voting for. They know their area best. So um, it's hard for me to answer this question. I can just look at the different things. Why don't you answer it this say, way? How do you, like, do you see this momentum continuing? I do. Do you see, like in states like New Hampshire, where, where Andrew's group's going to try to have a big influence, and if they can sit together, certainly will have a big influence? I, I think it's a smart way to do it, especially in that mm -hmm. state, in Iowa and South Carolina. I, I, that would be a smart thing for local groups to do, because then they are they're going to be able to have the most influence for their voice. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. You've done the math. That's how you would have to go about doing it. it, it the candidates so far, it's, it's so interesting because I hear things about people, but nobody is just excited about one person yet. They really are not. 
a lot of time, like I could tell Scott Brown was going to win here. Before the new year, before, between Christmas and New Year, I could tell that that's what was going to happen because that's how much information I was getting and, and buzz I was hearing about Scott Brown on social media, my email, my voicemail. On the presidential candidate, it's all over the board and everyone's kind of just sitting back waiting because they're not sure yet. Look, issues wise, the Tea Party has changed the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why we're all yeah, here. Right. That's why you know, a lot of people in the audience is, is here, because the, the, the Tea Party has been successful in changing the conversation to spending, taxes, deficit, debt, or whatever, focuses, focusing everyone's attention on that. But just in terms of the raw politics, I think what's going to be most interesting is the internal fight with, in the Republican Party itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, will the more establishment wing, like we all know that, the Republican nominating process for president is typically who's next in line? Yeah. Who's the next standard bearer, maybe who didn't win in the last election, or it's just that person that everyone deems is the next person to go. The Tea Party is gonna blow all that up. I like sure they are not, so. yeah, and, and, and yeah, you hear from her that she hopes so. Um, so <laughs> that won't happen, and so what we're seeing already are little threads and strands of infighting. You see the Tea Party Express, Jenny Beth's group doesn't endorse, but the Tea Party Express, another national group, does endorse. Mm -hmm. They've already got out and have been circulating, I'm sure you've gotten it to their target list with some Democrats, but also Republicans. Uh, Snow, Who are some of the Republicans? Uh, uh, Olympia Hatch, Snow. Hatch, Orrin Hatch. Orrin Hatch, Orrin Hatch. Uh, Luger, Dick Luger, Dick Luger mm -hmm. in Indiana. Yeah. So the infighting Republicans versus Republicans, I think someone even uh, likened it to Republicans eating their own, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be fascinating. And who emerges at the top of the heap in terms of a presidential candidate, who's able to kind of please the Tea Party, but also please the establishment Republicans is going to be fascinating. One, one rule change that it has gotten very little notice, but the party, Republican Party nominating process, all the primaries and caucuses that take place before April 1st, are the delegates will be awarded proportionally, not winner take all. Which means that it's more likely to, to this infighting, you could you know have split cards and have people go a little further. Normally Republicans are winner take all, and that's why it ends so quickly. Uh, and so as an incentive for people to push the primaries and caucuses back, they went to this proportional, think, and that'll make a big difference. If you think the Hillary and Barack Obama yeah. primary exactly, was long? Right. In my Kentucky May primary, we might matter. Who knows? Yeah. Kate, yeah. we'll, we'll let you the last word before we go to Q and A. Well, it's interesting because I, I sort of agree. I, I well, two things. One, I think that. It's striking to me that given all the energy of the Tea Party in the midterms in 2010, given how influential they are, that they have not rallied behind a single candidate now. That makes me think that the Tea Party will not be as influential in, in 2012. But we all know sort of the psychology of a presidential race. And so when I hear Andrew talking about how it's 25,000 votes and we can get 25,000 Tea Party members um, to, to unite behind one candidate, um, and you look at what's happening in states like Indiana, where they've decided to unite behind one Senate primary challenger to... Yeah, Mur uh, is it Murdoch, I think his name is the state Murdoch, treasurer. Murdoch, yeah, and yeah. They're, Murdoch, and this, maybe this guy Mike Delft, he may run. But they're, they're ha having a caucus this June, a full year ahead of the primary, to unite behind one candidate to challenge Dick Luger because they really want to get, they really think he's too establishment and want to win. So, um, so I do think that if, if the Tea Party can indeed unite behind candidates, that it, it can be a force. But the thing we have to remember about, this is another one of those sort of you know, demographic realities or, or just sort of um, numerical realities, like the fact that you can't balance the budget unless you take on you know, uh, entitlements and military spending. Presidential, the Tea Party probably would not have emerged so strong in a presidential race. Right. It's, it's significant that it came out in a midterm election because midterm elections tend to draw, obviously they draw lower turnout, they tend to draw a turnout that is, that is older, Loyalist. more hardcore, um, and frankly more white, which is what we've seen. You know, every poll of the Tea Party, I'm not saying the Tea Party is all white, I'm not saying the Tea Party is acting on race, but it is demographically, every poll the Tea Party has shown us that its members do tend to be older and white. Um, presidential years tend to draw a more diverse crowd of voters, a younger crowd of voters. So if that happens again in 2012, that will shift the dynamic mm -hmm. again. But I do think, again, talking about these primary challenges, that's, that's a huge thing. And I think a lot of Tea Party groups feeling this sort of lack of energy on the national level, on the presidential level, and thinking that you know, it's really going to depend on the economy, how Obama does, um, they're really focusing on, these, on, st on still on these local races, which is interesting. Yeah. I was talking to a candidate running for a down ticket office back in Kentucky, and she was telling me, that, and she's on the ballot, the primaries in May, that all the energy back in Kentucky is at, at the Tea Party activist level. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like the Tea Party back, or some of the Tea Party candidates are going to be the, 
it's victorious in the governor's race because right. they haven't been able to track resources. But there's clearly the energy is with those folks. Yeah. Back yeah, but in is it heat and fire? Is it just heat and fire and people you know riled up, or is it actual organized? I mean, we saw a lot of heat and fire in the Harry Reid Sherry Angle right. race in Nevada. A lot of heat and fire in the Delaware race with it's Christine organized. O'Donnell. And they lost. Yeah, I think it's, but it's organized. Well, it's, it, but those races also are where a national organization went in and handpicked a candidate before the primary. And we don't do that. And because we trust the local you, people. Yeah, you had the, you know, Christine O'Donnell was emerged victorious in a primary. Uh, general elections, a general election in Delaware is a different type of election. You know, they go back to who the voters are and the right. demographics and everything. <laughs> Before we go to q and I want to ask, how many people in the audience, everybody on stage has been to a Tea Party rally before, how many in the audience have actually been to a Tea Party rally? Just out of curious, curiosity, Let's see, okay. Good. And then how many would, in the audience would consider themselves a Tea Party activist or a Tea Party supporter? How about Tea Party supporter? Let's use that phrase. A little bit less. So we've got some who've gone, but no, pretty much those who've gone have been. Okay. So much for the People's Republic of Cambridge. Yeah, well, it is Cambridge. <laughs> uh, we were hoping to attract some people not from Cambridge <laughs> for tonight. Um, for, uh, at this point in the formal, we always do, no matter who the speaker is, we open it up for question and answers. So we've got microphones here and two in the front. Uh, we have two up on the stairs. Uh, what the rules are, one, identify yourself, and if you have an affiliation with the school, let us know. Second thing is the best questions are short and to the point uh, and are not um, following a speech. And the third is they end in a question mark. Uh, and uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can uh, before we get to the witching hour. So why don't we start over here. Hi, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Um, my name's Matt Mason. I'm an MPP here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, my question is, is directed towards Mr. Hemingway. Um, and my question is, what is, and, and if you could expand upon the strategic message of the Tea Party. Um, you spoke today, and that's, that's my question mark, <laughs> but um, the, the background and, and why I'd like you to, to, to follow up on a little bit is you spoke today that you're about the Constitution. Um, it's a very old document. I mean, if we, if we really want to do, you know, follow the Constitution, we disband the Army today because it doesn't call to, to fund an Army, for example. Okay. Um, and, and further, um, my, you know, you, you said, you know, what, it's, it's based on the values that America is, was founded upon. And, and I think those values are you know, the debate that we've always had in this country, you know, the, the Jefferson-Hamilton debate over the size of the banks. Um, so how, how is the Tea Party different from the, the very debates that we've always had in this country? Um, what sets you apart? Um, is, that, is that clear? Sir. Sure. Thanks. I, I, I think that the beauty of the, of the Tea Party is, is something that I alluded to earlier, and that is that it, it's not that we're unique. It's not that we're different from, from the past. It's, it's actually that we believe that, that the values and principles that made this country great, right? So life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to start with, right? The, the things that we see in the Constitution, the freedom of speech, the freedom of, to, to assemble, all of those, all of those things. Uh, it, America was, was really, as many people have, have said, an experiment in liberty. Can, can the individual actually you know, work inside of a civilized society? And, and can they, given the, you know, the freedom to make their own choices, to work with their hands, to do whatever they want to, provide for themselves and provide for their families, can that actually exist in a society? Because up to that point, we, you, know, you hadn't seen that in, in a, in a, in a, really in a government setting before. And so we, see, we, we saw that as an experiment kind of laid out. And the Constitution is the framework of that. The Constitution is the framework that lays out for our country and lays out for, for all of history the experiment. And I think you agree, and this, this you know, facility and, and when you look around you would, would, would indicate that, yeah, you know, that experiment was very successful. I mean, that experiment was very, very successful. Uh, and, and one that we want to see continue on. The problem is that as we look into the future, we see the, the, the repercussions of things going forward we see our prosperity, our freedom, our liberty, those values being stepped upon, being treaded upon, being, being altered. And with those alterings go the course of, uh, of our country. And we believe that if we can return back to a constitutionally based government, you know, fit to a modern era, if, if we can do that, I believe that our prosperity will again, you know, 
increase, our, our personal liberty will again increase. We will again be you know, the greatest nation on earth. There's a microphone. For those who are standing in line, there's another microphone up there that uh, well now has somebody in line. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, my name is Ned Tebbets, and I have a graduate degree from Harvard University. I've had a career as a fellow of the Society of Actuaries, working very closely with the Social Security Administration on Social Security and Medicare. In the current fiscal year, the aggregate across the country of all Medicare expenditures will be, will be substantially larger than all the payroll taxes collected for Medicare. And the same thing is true for Social Security in general. Now, this, uh, this situation is going to get worse and worse in the future due to the aging of the baby boom uh, people. Now, what action does the Tea Party uh, propose to deal with this inadequate financing for Medicare and Social Security? I want to let Jimmy Beth go first on that one since Andrew just answered. We'll let him think a little bit. We're go we don't have the specific answer for how to address <laughs> Social Security. We understand it has to be addressed. I'm 40 years old. I, I honestly don't think I'll see a penny of it. And I, I think that pretty much anyone who's at, at least my age and younger, and maybe even 50 and younger, really don't expect to see anything from their Social Security fund. And we understand there's a problem. What we've said, and, and it does go to what both of you are saying in the specifics of it, we, I have not sworn, I haven't taken an oath to swear that I'd uphold the Constitution and then create a budget and pass a budget. And I don't know every single line item. What I do know is that the spending is out of control and we have to do something to stop it. And every single one of us in here are going to have to make some kind of sacrifice. If we don't, the people who are younger than us, they're not going to have the same opportunity that we had growing up. So. I think, what she, I think what she said I, is that, well, that you know, she doesn't have the specific, she's not, she's not in a position to But I am, and, and, I, and I'm willing, I'm 40 years old, I'm willing not to take a penny of it and keep paying into it to make the, to figure out how we're going to reform the system if that's what it takes. I'm willing to make that sacrifice myself. Andrew and then Shannon. Just briefly, we, we, this is, a, this is a, a movement. We're not a political party, and we're not putting forward policy suggestions. You know, we're, we, 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 nobody representing the Tea Party is writing policy. There are a lot of really great conservative think tanks out there, like the Heritage Foundation, who have some really great scholars, who have put out some really great thoughts on how to handle Social Security. And you know, why recreate the wheel? If we've got somebody there who's doing a, doing a phenomenal job, who can you know, put out these reports, then we'll support those types of things. We're not writing policy. Shannon. I was actually gonna make another point, but to, to, to Andrew's point, I think that people need to understand that though the Tea Party doesn't push specific policies, they're advocating for lawmakers who will then get in and right. push specific policies. So there's, a, there's a, a chain, a link, kind of a chain reaction. Uh, and people should understand whether they're for it or against it, they should understand that, hey, the Tea Party wants me to support this candidate, I'm gonna vote for this candidate, but this candidate is going to do this, that, or other with Medicare, this, that, or the other, with Social Security or what have you, and this will be the impact of that. And one last thing that, that I just wanted to add that we haven't touched on is both sides agree that these, there needs to be entitlement reform. There's obviously a big gulf between right. you know, how it should be done, Obama offering his plan and Ron, the House Republican plan. But one thing that's really important, and, and people should understand this, is the idea of revenue, um, raising the amount of revenue. So cutting spending, the amount that the government spends, but also raising the amount of money that the government takes in. And one way that the Obama administration, a lot of Democrats want to do that, is raising taxes on people who make over $250,000 a year. Now they feel like, if you're going to reform Medicaid, Medicare, what have you, which disproportionately affect older people and poor people, what have you, you shouldn't give a big tax cut to what they call wealthy people. They, that's a fundamental principle of theirs. Republicans feel like that it's a tax increase and it hurts jobs because most of the people who make over $250,000 a year are small businesses and they are the ones who are hiring more people. So I just don't want it to be lost on this discussion that the issue of taxes and revenue raising is important also. Up in the box there. 
Hi, my name is Harlan. I'm a sophomore at the college. I do want to just follow up on that last question that was asked. Uh, because I see the, the way that uh, historical movements have been gone about is, of course, they're, they've been gone about in favor of something. They're advocating for something. But what's different about the Tea Party, it seems, is that a lot of the policies, or a lot of, rather not policies, but a lot of the framing of it is in opposition to the status quo. That's worked in the short term, but not been a long-term strategy in the past. I'm curious, and maybe this is a, re a question for the reporters, although it's for all of you as well. What is the, the Tea Party, what does the Tea Party stand for, rather than what does it stand against? Fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. And they're all pros. It's what we're for. Yeah, I think maybe, I think Andrew and Kate, or Jenny Beth both kind of said that at the beginning. Maybe take, take the, the larger part of the question about sort of the, the status quo, then you get power. Uh, and, we, and we've heard a little bit about this tonight, about how you know, Republicans got in, and now there's some anger about how the Republicans right. are doing. What's your I think take this on is that what case? I was talking about earlier, is that a lot of people came to this with frustration and with, as you say, with an anti-vote rather than a pro-vote. Um, they don't have a specific policy that they want to, uh, that they embrace. Um, they just didn't like what was happening, and so therefore they voted against it. Um, you know, I don't think this is the first time we've seen that, certainly. Um, you might even argue that we saw that in 2006 when there was a big tide for the Democrats. I'm not, I haven't really sort of thought that through, but I think you could probably make that case. Um, so, so I think you're absolutely right that there, that there is, there, the, the Tea Party was much more clearly defined by what it was against or the idea of what it was against than it is what it's for. Um, and I think that, that there is disagreement. I think if you, if you polled or did focus groups among Tea Partiers, they would, uh, they would have pretty divergent answers. I mean, you know, for instance, I remember just in the weeks before, um, before the election, there was this guy who we interviewed in Nevada, and he said, uh, he said, I want, I want gridlock. I don't want any more laws. <laughs> but I think a lot of people just wanted Congress to do something, and their frustration with Congress is that they feel like Congress doesn't do anything. So, you know, get to work. Um, so I think, I think even sort of on an, on an emotional, uh, on that emotional level, they don't have a, a sense of, of what they are, what they want to change. They just know they want a change. In one really provocative thought that some have offered, would the Tea Party be as strong as it is now if the economy wasn't so bad? If so many people weren't I would argue out of the Tea work? Party wouldn't have existed. I would Possibly. say that had stimulus never come about, it wouldn't exist. Well, and the stimulus wouldn't have yeah, happened. Yeah, because the of the economy. Mm -hmm. So I, I absolutely, I mean, there's, they do go hand in hand. Yes. Hello? Just keep, just keep talking. No. Okay. Hello, my name is Patrick Humphreys. I'm a Tea Party organizer from the greater Boston area. Uh, mine goes, my question goes a little bit to the area of PR because I think the Tea Party overall has a PR problem the way it's uh, uh, portrayed in the mainstream media. We're racist, sexist, homophobes, whatever. Uh, we're violent. And uh, that last point kind of really uh, irks me since uh, typically Tea Party people are older, um, they're, they're good people. And the violence is actually done to the Tea Party people instead of by them. Um, and I'm just wondering how we, uh, I guess that's a kind of a question for the panel overall. Um, how do we try to uh, accurately portray the Tea Party for what, what it truly is? You know, I, I just have to disagree that that's the way the Tea Party is being portrayed. I think if you look at our coverage over the months, if you look at, you know, I, I wrote a book that I think comes pretty straight, you know, as close to straight down the middle as you can get, and I'm not just defending myself, but I just think that, you know, the mainstream media has, has, has kind of truth squatted a lot of this stuff, and yes, there has been some um, more polemical stuff, maybe from columnists, but, but I think reporters have been pretty fair about going out and, and looking at what the Tea Party is about. Um, I, 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 I would agree. I think that for as much as some in the media might portray the Tea Party movement as being racist or what have you. I think there's also a strain in the Tea Party movement that believes that if you aren't certain outlets that you're just pushing all of these stereotypes and myths about the movement. Um, speaking for my network in particular, we have been very responsible about covering a wide range of stories about the movement. Now, in the beginning, when people didn't really know what it was, there were, I mean, a lot of people were alarmed by signs. 
uh, about Obama. I saw one myself I actually saved the picture because it was so outlandish of President Obama dressed as a pimp, like full 70s garb, and Nancy Pelosi as a prostitute. And she was, he was pimping her, and it was like on the street. Now, that was one sign out of many that I've seen, but it was so over the top that it tends to just draw, you know, draw, your, draw your attention. <laughs> Um, but we have been very responsible in putting those things in context. Jess, you'll see this, but this is one of many. In my documentary that I did, Kate mentioned her book, uh, same thing in my documentary. It, I mean, maybe in, during the hour-long uh, documentary, maybe we explored that theme for maybe five minutes. The yeah, rest was about, you know, what are they about? What do they stand for? Who are some of the key players? I think you're right that this was an early perception, but I do think there was um, some pretty good reporting to try to sort of get to, to what the truth was. I'll give you an example. When the NAACP did their report saying that, which I think a lot of Tea Partiers took to mean, they took the ultimate conclusion to be the Tea Party is racist. That wasn't the conclusion of the report. The report was there are some racist right. signs. You know, I think we were pretty careful to say they give examples of, I think it was seven signs that they had found. I mean, we, we, right. we tried to put it in context and to say some of the groups they're looking at aren't really actually Tea Party groups. They're online forums for angry people. They're not, you know, they're not sort of the, the, the heart of the Tea Party. I would agree that, um, that a, lot of, a lot of the coverage that I've seen has been a misrepre misrepresentation of the Tea Party as a whole. Um, on the national and on, on the state level. The, the Tea Party does have a PR problem, and it's going to continue to have a PR problem because we are, as, as Jenny Beth will attest, we are a grassroots organization. We don't have uh, you know, a $10 million budget to hire a PR firm and come in and uh, you know, represent us uh, because we're not organized like that because we're average citizens who are upset about what's going on, and literally we're going out to the center of our town with signs going, they'll stop the spending. Like, if there's nothing else we can do. Let's hold up a sign because we're at our, we're at our wit's end. And we're going to continue to have a PR problem because, because we are a, a, populist, a populist movement, we are, um, but we are pushing against the establishment. You know, really, we're rebels. Uh, and, and we're pushing against what has been deemed the right way to do things in our country. And so, you know, yes, I believe that there is a, a very large segment of the media who is going to be out there trying to misrepresent us. I mean, if you look at uh, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, you see the, the, the platform, you see the steps, you see the stages of exactly what's going to happen, and it's been playing itself out uh, in, the, in, in a lot of what I would say mainstream media. Jim very quickly, thank you for helping us get the movement and our message out. There's always going to be people in the media who say things you don't like. If we were on the other side of the political spectrum, the same thing would happen. And what I generally tell people, and I get asked your question often on talk radio, I just think we keep pushing forward. We answer the questions when they're presented to us. We make sure we keep self-policing. So when there are the seven obnoxious and completely wrong signs or the people who do the wrong things, we get rid of them. And if we need to do it very publicly, we do it publicly. And then we just keep pushing forward. The last few, I haven't been on CNN very often mm -hmm. recently, but the last two times I've been on, they've asked me the racist question. Even just two weeks ago, I still got asked the question. So I answered it, and then we just move on. And it's frustrating because it keeps coming up on one particular network. <laughs> even I'm though sorry. you're not doing yeah. it. But at the same time, there are people who are watching who have that misperception. And it gives me, I, I look at, instead of being angry about it, I look at it as the opportunity to set the record straight and say, at Tea Party Patriots, we will not put up with it. And there is a line in cement that we're not going to cross. And so uh, I look at it as an opportunity rather than as, as something to be opposed to. Two really, really quick points. One. Um, and I'm not picking on your network. No, 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 no. I think we do a really good job. Um, <laughs> I thought it was a, I thought it was I a fair I interview, really, even really with the, the question. Two really quick things. Uh, on the one hand, there, there are obviously a lot of Tea Party activists who take umbrage with the media coverage, the mainstream media coverage of the movement. But let's not forget that the Tea Party movement also benefits from, from mainstream media coverage. Like, Absolutely. You know, they have grown and exploded from being on my network and her newspaper and other outlets as well. Uh, and the second thing is, you know, this is, this is not unlike what you see from mostly, virtually every movement that's out there. As they grow, their critics grow, 
uh, the, the coverage of them might be skewered. I mean, you saw it with environmentalists who were sometimes depicted as anarchists, with you know, anti-war activists who were uh, maybe skewered as being extreme. So the Tea Party movement is not alone in having some, some in the media that might skewer the coverage of them. Uh, it's just a factor of being a growing It happens movement. on either side. On either, either side, side of the, and we whatever also people the get their, you know, so many people get their news from, you know, John Stewart, Jay Leno, who are going to make fun of whomever. Right. You know, they're going to, they're going to stare, they're going to take that stereotype and run with it. It's, I think it's unfortunately in modern day, it's what we're stuck with in the media. Thanks Hi, for uh, your question. My name is Jesse Wilderman. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm also, I come out of the labor movement, so I'm glad to hear we're well organized in Wisconsin. Um, but uh, <laughs> Very well. Um, the question I have, I, I want to sort of believe that the Tea Party is a grassroots movement, as you say it is, um, and not just a shell for the Koch brothers or for uh, Dick Army or, you know, some of the other people who are funding the operation. And so one of the questions I have is, and one idea I had about where the left and the right actually may agree is, is money in politics and the amount of money that's in politics today and whether the Tea Party is concerned about that issue and, you know, and would be willing to, I know you say you don't support policies, but you know, would, would that be something that you would support, you know, for example, a constitutional amendment or some way, given what happened in 2010 and the amount of money that went into politics because of the Citizens United decision, uh, you know, is there, um, people within your organizations who would say the political system is partly bankrupt because there's so much money in it, let's say from unions and from corporations. And is that something that you would get animated about or organized around? Can, you can go first. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me address the first, the, the first thing. If you know the Koch brothers and if we could get a check from them, like, I would be <laughs> as ecstatic, seriously. Like, uh, you should I, probably explain who the Koch brothers are. Yeah, why don't you explain people. Yeah. So, so, well, uh, I really don't know the, well, the, so the, the, Koch, the, the Koch brothers are billionaires, yeah. American billionaires who started Americans for Prosperity, basically. Yeah, there's and a company called Koch Industries, which is sort of a family, well, it's a big Long company based in Wichita. And, and they, they give a lot of money to libertarian and conservative I think it's the second largest. So, so I, I run second like a libertarian slash conservative no, organization, the largest one in the state of New Hampshire, who's going to have a dramatic impact on the presidential race. If, if the Koch brothers wanted to you know, give money and play in presidential politics and in grassroots politics, I, I think at some point I would be getting a call from them. I mean, I think that at some point I would be contacted by them. I'm not trying to be proud, I'm just trying to say, I, I think that I'm in one of those places that that's gonna happen. Um, and I tell you, I, I promise you, you can look at our financial records. We disclose all of our financial records. We're not getting money from hardly anybody, uh, not to <laughs> mention the Goat Brothers. So everything that we're doing, and my wife can, can, can tell you, or my family can tell you that, you know, we're not, you know, able to, to, you know, fund all this stuff. It's just happening organically. It's not coming from Koch brothers. Second of all, money in politics is absolutely a oh, huge, a, a huge problem. And one that, one that I, I think needs to be, needs to be addressed in, in a big way. So yeah, I think, you know, as, as Tea Party activists, I think that we absolutely would. I think we, you know, move more for, you know, a, a, demolishing of the FEC and, you know, let people speak with their dollars, uh, freedom of speech type of a, a mentality, but that's, that's my approach to it. I, I've done a fair amount of reporting on the money chase, if you will, and, and some reporting on the Koch brothers as well. So, I mean, basically, you know, again, the Koch brothers are billionaires. I think it's the second largest company either in the country or in the it's world, second, I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, I think it's second largest privately owned country. Yeah, company in, in the country. Uh, they're rich, like beyond belief, right? So the argument is that these two billionaire brothers and a few others like them, but their names rise up to the top more than anyone else's, are funding this conservative grassroots movement that critics call astroturf, you know, it's not really grassroots, um, to further their own self-interest. So they run this kind of environmental kind of manufacturing company or whatever, and so they don't want regulations, environmental regulations, the argument goes. They don't want um, for a lot of things that would stand in the way to furthering their business and i.e. their wealth. Um, that's what their critics say. I mean, is there evidence of that? There is evidence that they support, they have supported traditionally in the past conservative groups, Americans for Prosperity, which is a big backer of the Tea Party movement. Uh, and they've given money to other, uh, I think, the um, uh, Heritage Foundation and some other groups, Cato. so what have Cato, Cato, excuse me. Um, but on the other side, the Koch brothers and their representatives and their supporters say, 
Look, it's free speech. Uh, it's free enterprise. They pr they're promoting, they're putting their money towards promoting free markets. What's wrong with that? Um, right, like George Soros. Like right? George Soros, who's a liberal billionaire, you know, and funds his liberal causes. So, well, Kate, why don't we ask? Kate, what's your take on the Koch brothers and their impact on this movement? And then I'll come back to Jenny Beth on the I specific think, question so, about the, um, the policy. Uh, the Tea Party, I think, genuinely started as a grassroots movement. You don't need a lot of you don't need a lot of money to start a Tea Party. You need people who are angry enough to take their signs to the streets. Have, that said. I think groups like Freedom Works and Americans for Prosperity did very quickly see, hey, this is great for us. We can work with this. We can shape this. We can give them money. So for instance, one of the activists I, I profile in my book um, is now working for Americans for Prosperity in Pennsylvania. This is a woman who literally stumbled on a tea party one day. She went out for a picnic with her husband and her, I think it was a six-month-old child, and came upon this park, Washington Crossing Park in Pennsylvania, and they were having a tea party, and it, she loved the country music of the signs, and her husband was horrified, but she was like, no, no, we gotta go to this thing. So they went, she became a, she became a huge activist. She's definitely grassroots, but now she's working for American, Americans for Prosperity because they have come in and said, we will give you money to help organize. So I think there, is, there are elements, it, it started as grassroots, there are elements of, of these big groups coming in and helping out. Um, I don't think the Koch, I think this is, it is completely wrong to say the Koch brothers are starting the Tea Party, or, sorry, are funding the Tea Party. Right. Um, again, another, in, another thing that I talk about in the book is these groups were actually trying to start, they even used the imagery of the Tea Party in some of their early literature going back as far as 2002. They said like, you know, we should have, they talked about having a Tea Party and it didn't catch on because the economy was not in a position where, um, you know, where, where people were going to respond to this. It was, it was a very, it was, it was the, the, the circumstance of the economy that made people react in a particularly emotional way. So I don't think the Koch brothers are, um, are I think, they, you know, the, obviously Americans for Prosperity has a role in this. I don't think they are the key backers of the Tea Party. Um, I do think it was organic. Um, there was a second part of your question. Oh, as far as money and politics, um, I think that here's where you're going to have a problem. A lot of Tea Partiers are, um, you know, by definition, they are conservative Republicans, and they are going to believe. I think Andrew said, like Andrew of, said, exactly yeah. that that this is free. It's a matter of free speech, and so they're going to differ from the left, which does not believe that, which is, does not believe that money is speech, and believes that it should be restricted. Jenny Beth, I know you, again, you can't speak for the, whole, the, the the patriots of the whole party, but what's your take on the money and politics uh, okay. policy standpoint? It's, and Americans for Prosperity and Freedom Works, they existed before this right. movement, like she said, and they were funded. By who, I, I don't know who all funds Freedom Works. We've heard of the Koch brothers behind Americans for Prosperity. Had this movement not started, they'd still be here. And I think the difference with me sitting here right now is I wouldn't be here had it not been for Santelli's rant and the things that happened from that. Um, the, the money, the way that Tea Party Patriots works is that we take an issue, if there's an issue, if one of our coordinators came to us and enough people were saying, we want to do something with campaign finance, then we'd say, okay, we take it to our local coordinators, that conference call that I mentioned at the very beginning, we do that still at least once a week, every week, we only haven't done it for five weeks in the past 26 months. And so there has to be enough people talking about it that we take it to our local coordinators and then we pull them on it. At this point, the question you're asking hasn't come up. I think one thing that you and I probably both could agree on is that the special interest money that the government gives out, that, that, they, that the government, our tax money that they're giving out to businesses or whatever it may be, tax benefits, however it, it shakes out, that then comes back in as campaign contributions, getting rid of those special interests that the government gives out, that would be a good first step. Hi, thank you so much. So my name is Stephanie Lewis. I'm a senior government concentrator at Harvard, and I have a two-part question. So first, assuming that many Tea Party activists or potential members of Congress who are running um, are libertarians, uh, do they are they, in, in, in essence, you know, promoting gridlock because that will reduce spending? Um, alternately, if they are elected and then try to pass policies that you know, have longer term uh, fiscal reductions or in spending, but might not yield short term benefits like pork barrel spending for the districts that they can clearly point to, would they be reelected? Re and you know, how would that uh, fulfill you know, the next thing that's going on? So in, in essence, the second part is, would constituents really vote for a, 
uh, sort of a long-term candidate. Yeah, I think you know a lot of kind of members of Congress run on what they've done for their district. You know, this bridge, this pothole, whatever. Um, how do you think it's going to play out in the election? Um, where they're going to, as these cuts are made, you know, as they can't. Well, well they. Bring they home the bacon or whatever. Yeah, they yeah. can't do that, right? Well, they've committed not to right. to doing that right now. So that that spending in this congressional cycle theoretically isn't going to be there. Um, it, I, I think right now people are looking at the bottom line that they're getting in their paycheck, and so they're going to look. They're going to say, "Is this really helping me? Am I actually employed? Do I ha Am I able to get a raise?" or at least not get a decrease in my salary. So I think right now that's what people are looking at for the results from. I, I also <laughs> want to say that, that we have many members of Congress who um, have been supported by their congressional districts who have, you know, throughout their course of history, um, been, you know, representative of those things. I mean, I think, I mean obviously Ron Paul is an example yeah. of that. Actually, Speaker Boehner took, has never taken an earmark. Right, Speaker Boehner. I mean, there, there are a number of those guys. Um, you know, you don't normally, you see uh, guys who are really tied in, members of Congress who are really tied in with the special interest groups in their congressional district, who are really tied in with their, you know, different trade associations, stuff like that. Those are, are the members of Congress who need, you know, who, who they think they need those things. I think what's happened is there's a greater awareness on the grassroots, on the, on the average citizen street level, there's a greater awareness of the idea of, you know, how evil earmarks are what earmarks really, really are. And there's this idea, I mean, across, all across the country um, that, that the spending is wildly out of control. Regardless of where that money's being spent, it's bad to be being spent. And so I think that, that yeah, I think that voters will be voting for uh, candidates who can uh, articulate for the long term, this is the best policy for our country going forward. I would just add one small thing and say, as I said before, although the Tea Party has successfully changed the conversation, I don't know that they've changed everyone's minds. I mean, I would guess that they haven't changed everyone's minds. Um, a lot of the members are obviously Republicans, you know, Republican loyalists. Some of them are independents, you know, although polling shows that, that they might be a far fewer independents than just Republicans who are Republicans already and are just kind of Tea Party activists. Um, but I think we will only really, really be able to gauge whether these you know, politicians who are not bringing home the bacon will be reelected or not if once people start to see a drying up of you know, benefit services or whatever, we want it less spending, but this is the real impact of it, do we like this? And I don't think that we've, we've really been able to see that yet. Tom, probably this is going to have to be the last question. I realize a couple more folks have questions. I'm not going to. They may be able to stick around. You maybe can ask them afterwards, or they're all pretty accessible via Twitter. Mm -hmm. You can probably tweet a question to them too. So this is going to be the last one. Hi, thanks. My name is Flomar Moras. I'm a second year business school student at Harvard. My question is: Whenever you speak about the ideas of what the Tea Party stands for, it's like fiscal responsibility, the Constitution, liberty, free markets. These are things that everyone agrees on. I think most is like these are things that America was founded on. So. What happens when these very high-level idealistic ideas have to start to get implemented? And there's discord within members of the Tea Party. How do you kind of balance the idea of getting people fired up, but also getting something accomplished? So we're watching it play out in Wisconsin. We're watching it play out in Congress right now as well. And, you know, in, in Congress, where I'm watching right now is the Republicans who said they, they supported our, our ideals and they made, they signed a pledge that they were supporting particular things, seeing if they're going to keep their promises or not. And, you know, the, the Democrats said that the $100 billion that we were asking for, Tea Party patriots were asking for, which we were asking for because the Republicans pledged it, and by the way, we found out they just kind of pulled that number out of thin air, thin air because they thought it sounded good. <laughs> I bet they don't do that again. <laughs> um, but they anyway, win the election, maybe. <laughs> but it was only 2.6 pennies being cut out of every dollar that's spent in the federal government. It's not extreme, even though that's what Senator Reid and Senator Schumer were saying. And so we have to go and we have to talk to people and, and spread our message around the, 
the way that our network works and make sure people understand what we're actually advocating for and then get them to go talk to their congressmen and senators or their state legislators and governors to, to pass the legislation we're looking for. Does that answer your question? Uh, <laughs> so, Sorry. for example, fiscal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Well, you can raise taxes by a great deal. You can cut many different programs and different combinations, different weights. So it's like, it's like exactly how you get everyone around the same idea and say, okay, we want to be fiscally responsible, so we're going to have to take these three actions in order to get our vision accomplished as opposed to 10 different visions on how to get that vision accomplished. So then as the legislators put forth ideas, we evaluate or put forth policy suggestions or the think tanks do that. We look at those, those policy suggestions or the bills and we go through and evaluate it and read it and decide whether we're going to support it or not. And at Tea Party Patriots, if we have over 60% of our local coordinators saying we support it, then that's how we take it on. I think you're asking, a, I mean, it's a really great question, and I think you're asking a fundamental question that every organizer of every group, you know, talk, talks about. I think, um, and probably because of your HBS background, it's probably, it's, it's a really a management question. It is, you know, how do you motivate people to coalesce around one ideal, even though maybe all the different parts of that organization aren't as, you know, uh, fired up about that one thing as, as the, the whole group is. And I think the idea is, that again, we are a movement, we are not a political party, and we are not putting forward um, you know, exact uh, policy suggestions. And, and I don't think you're gonna see the Tea Party doing that. You may see you know, different people out here or there, or there you know, coming up with ideas and ways to do this. Again, I think what Shannon said was, was pretty accurate, is that we're gonna, we're gonna find uh, legislators or candidates who are gonna say, hey look, this is, this is the way that we wanna go out and implement this or implement that. And I think ultimately in a policy discussion, especially at the federal level, it normally comes down to, you know, A or B. And, and the liberty answer is normally pretty, pretty obvious. Um, and I think that, that helps to coalesce the group, is that the, the normal political kind of discourse ends up consolidating itself down to either, you know, option A or option B. And I think that, that basically is kind of how the groups end up going, okay, this is, this is the way we're going to go. Do you guys have anything you want to add to this? No, I guess I would just say it's what I was saying earlier is that it's very hard to sort of figure out in many cases what the Tea Party stands for. I mean, I think some of the things are sort of, um, can be defined specifically. I mean, the Constitution says certain things and that, you know, you can hold the Tea Party to, and the, 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 some Tea Partiers will tell you the Constitution says Congress should do 22 things and there they are listed and if it's not there, it shouldn't be doing it. And we, you know, Rand Paul says we could balance the federal budget if we just did these things. So, but I do think, yeah, something like fiscal responsibility, I mean, this is classic, this is classic marketing, right? This is classic political language, and you, you, you make it so broad that everyone can agree with it. Um, and I think that's sort of, that's, that's, it was a Tea Party success in the, in the midterms, and it's somewhat, it's not their undoing, but it's the difficulty of dealing with the Tea Party now that, that it comes to actual policy and looking at the budget. I, I have one follow-up where I, I can tell you what we're doing in practice. There's a group of people who came to us and said, we have a suggestion for how to bring government control, make it more limited, limited government, constitutionally limited government, and it also deals with the government takeover of healthcare, which we were opposed to. And it was called, is called the Healthcare Compact. We have those webinars, conference calls that I discussed every single week. We also do local coordinator summits a few times a year. Last year we did four, this year we've done two so far in person. This was a very complex policy, so we decided it needed to be in person. We brought the people, the people came in, they presented it to our local coordinators, we had a panel on it, the local coordinators asked questions and really thought about it, decided is this something we want to support or not. The next day there were people who were standing up saying yes, I'm going to support it. And then like two or three weeks later after we'd had time to really digest the information, we asked the coordinators on the webinar, is this something that we want to take on as Tea Party Patriots? And it's something that we've done, and now it's being introduced in state legislatures around the country, and ultimately it'll go to Congress. So that is a very specific example of how we're implementing policy. Can I, I'm sorry. Can, can I, I add one more Dr. thing? Dr. Scotch will ask what was in the policy. Yeah, I, I studied healthcare and the people, I don't know what's in that. Well, why don't we, if you can do this, we're, we're wrapping up. Why don't you get, can you guys hook up yeah, afterwards and talk? I'm happy to afterwards. Yeah, okay.
So, uh, Andrew, I, maybe the last word. I'm sorry, just, just one last thing. One of the things we say, you know, fiscal responsibility is not just, uh, not just political language. I think, you know, when you boil it down, it's about, we've been talking about spending. And I think what, what the Tea Party is fighting for is moral spending. And what I mean by that is the amount of spending that's occurring right now is immoral to, to burden our children and our grandchildren um, with the amount of spending and the amount of debt that we are at right now is Im it, it's literally immoral. Um, and, and so when we say we want you know, to cut back on spending, that's what we mean. I mean, like, cut back on spending. You know, if, so some people are going to go, oh, do you mean 10% uh, across the board? Sure. <laughs> like, yeah, okay, we'll take it. Uh, you know, do you mean 50% across the board? You know, whatever the numbers are, Rand Paul to you know, whoever. So I, I, think, I think that, that though they may be you know, deemed as you know, political language or you know, kind of broad sense, I think they have very uh, exacting ideas and, and you know, practices tied to them. But again, I think people are going to disagree on what is moral spending. I mean, I think you know, you're going to talk to a lot of people who don't think that it's moral to have 40 million people without health insurance is coming. I mean, I'm just... Well, still offering tax well, I think, cuts. And I think what we're saying, and this is actually the perfect last question because I think it's sort of this transition from, there was an election, the Tea Party right. was very influential, They're, they won, all right? Now they have to govern, and then they have to run on their record. Mm -hmm. And how that plays out over the next year and a half to two years, I think is going to be the, one of the most interesting stories in American politics. And that's why I'm glad you all came tonight <laughs> so we can start this conversation. Please join me in thanking Kate, Shannon, Jenny, Beth, and Andrew. Uh, for their for their insights, um, and I, I want to put a plug in. On Thursday, we have our our uh, next public our next forum: oil spills, earthquakes, tsunamis, and meltdowns. Uh, we're going to talk about disaster preparedness and recovery and response, and how do we? What lessons have we learned over the last couple of years? What lessons should we have learned uh, as we go forward? We've got Coast Guard, National Guard, a former member of Congress, a former, former uh, Assistant Deputy Homeland Security. Uh, Assistant Secretary for Homeland Security. Great conversation Thursday, 6 o'clock, right here in the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, thank you all, and thanks again for great discussion. Great discussion. That was great.